It's a great song. It's, uh, <laughs> Let's just pause and listen to it right now. Show me that smile again. Show me that smile. Don't waste another minute on your crying. We're nowhere near the end. We're the near best the is end. ready to begin. As long as we've got each other. We got the world spinning <laughs> right in our hands. Rainbow. The rest you'll have to pay me. All, All the time. time. <laughs> we've got each other. Sharing the laughter and love. Cool. I don't know math anymore, but yeah. that shit just comes <laughs> right back in the brain. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to S1E1, the show where each week we pick a different sitcom, watch just the first televised episode, and forgetting anything we might know about the future run of that show, rate it and decide if it's a show we want to greenlight or cancel. This week we're going to be talking about Growing Pains. Growing Pains went 166 episodes over seven seasons on ABC. Today we're talking about episode one, which was called Pilot, originally airing September 24th, 1985. But to get things started, I'm Jay Gags. With me, as always, the boys, Gordo, Joe, Ferg, and Nick. What's going on, guys? Hey, yo. Hello. Who's Boner? Who's Boner? I, I can kiss the kids later. Is that how he said that? <laughs> too breathy? Did I do a wrong read? <laughs> That's why I didn't get the part in the show. I read it wrong. They were like, get out of this room. Get out of this audition. Correct. You didn't get the part in the show because you weren't born. <laughs> True, but also a weird thing to think of is that Alan Thicke at this time is pretty much the exact same age we all are. And that always makes my brain explode a little bit. It's always weird when you look back at shows. It's just like an era thing. I I just sent you guys. It was like that. Uh, not a meme, but it was like a video on Instagram. It was just showing high school kids in like the mid 80s and they all just look like they're 50. I just saw yeah. that, too, actually. But was it what's I mean, yes, they look different. They do look older. I don't know how old Alan Thicke actually was. But was it that common to have three kids at 35 years yeah. old? Like, that Super. old, though? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, that means he had him when he was 20. No, his oldest, yeah. his oldest was 15. Yes. So, yeah, he would have been 20, 23 when he had his first son. Yeah, it's not crazy. And clearly Ben was just an accident. <laughs> no, no, Ben was not an accident. If you watch this show for a long time, you realize that there is an oops baby that actually comes along a couple <laughs> seasons later. Yeah. And then an oops, Leonardo DiCaprio. So, growing pain, jo- Joe, this is your pick. Um, oh, it's any Joe particular pains. reason? I did love this show a lot as a kid, but weirdly, I loved more Just the Ten of Us, the spinoff of this show. So I needed to activate this so that we could eventually do Just the Ten of Us. But I, I don't think this. I ever saw it. Just Ten of Us is, so for a few seasons in this show, one of the main characters is like the ball-busting like, coach, gym teacher uh, at Mike's school. And then they spin off, and he has eight children. So it's him and his wife and eight kids. Heather Langenkamp is one of them, Ferg. Ooh. And it's AKA just like a Nancy. weird, super funny show. But, like, it was so wild because you had to have so many balls in the air because you're juggling so many kids that there's so many stories happening. And I always remember there's a really great episode where he makes his son a skateboard. And then he thinks the skateboard is lame because it's not, like, a name brand one. And the dad finds it in the trash, and it's super emotional. And oh, spoiler alert! He rides it, and the skateboard is great. It's like episode ninety. It's not like it's the pilot. We probably won't talk. I mean, I'll talk now, about it then. Now that's too, that's but. original TGIF, right? That's first lineup. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we got to cover that, and then because I think that only came along around the second or third season of Growing Pains, and I think there was a little bit maybe of like crossover where he was on both for a bit too to try to like bring the worlds together. It's weird. I have basically no recollection of that show at all. I remember. Yeah, neither it. do I. It was one of those shows that played a lot on like USA Network. It was like in the on Saturdays. It was like in the summertime. American Gladiators, Major Dad, and uh, uh, just ten of us. Like those were always on. So I watched them just a ton for like the summers when I was a kid. I don't remember that block at all. With that, um, with that new Netflix thing that came out on American Gladiators, I guarantee they're gonna reboot it again. I know they tried doing it like ten plus years ago, but it's gonna with happen. Hulk Hogan. It was awful. Yeah, and um. Muhammad Ali's daughter. Yes. Ali Ali. Ali Ali oxen free. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem now, though, is that American Ninja Warrior is pretty much American Gladiators 
but just nobody's trying to hip check you the whole time. Oh man, American so, Ninja War is shit. Yeah, it's, it's American cool. Ninja War is fun, but I'm just saying, like, I don't know if there's appetite for that and Gladiators now. I think that one has to be off the air for a bit. No, what you have to do is you have to play into the cheese of nostalgia with the old gladiators. You can't modernize <laughs> it. All it with like, <laughs> like don't but like don't make it like a fun modern version. You have to like make it super like glammed out eighties. And you can't get rid of the tennis ball gun. No. That was always oh, the God, most no. amazing thing ever. It was everyone's dream to one day be able to shoot that thing. Yeah. Essentially, too, that, that gun was just the gun from uh, carnivals where you shoot the clown's teeth out. Yeah, it's just basically a high-powered CO2 version of that. Um, but yeah, so as far as Growing Pains goes, what about the rest of you as far as how much do you remember the show? Did you watch it a lot as a kid? I definitely did not watch this a lot as a kid. I don't know, really know why was this. I don't know if this was a, ever really a, a Nick at Night staple or not. I don't think so. I just, yeah, I don't know. I just don't really remember. I barely remembered the sister at all. I kind of forgot hmm. she even existed. The younger brother, I do remember. And, you know, I, yeah, I don't know. I just, I didn't recall much of this. I expected to recall more than I did. This is legitimately one of the first sitcoms I remember ever seeing, like, as, like, a kid. I think it's because the theme song stuck out. Oh, the theme song is, like, forever, like, embedded in my yeah. brain. <laughs> but the show itself is one of those... Definitely saw a ton of it as a kid. As far as particular storylines and stuff like that, I have I remember almost nothing about it, but I remember watching it a lot. I remember watching it, but I don't remember anything about it. Like, I couldn't have watched it that much if I don't remember something from it. We were also super young, keep in mind. So, like, when this pilot episode came out, Gordo, you're the only one alive. <laughs> and so it's, j and, and not by a lot, we're all pretty similar in age, but... It's teetering right on that line of right when we were all... The show was basically born when we were. So mm. for it to go seven seasons, we're all six, seven years old when the show is at an end. So yeah, we have some sticking memories of when it was like live. But other than you know syndication runs and stuff, this wasn't completely of our era. But it was such a popular show that it, it lasted for a little bit. This also has, brings up uh, an S1E1 first, too. Do you guys know what it is? First boner? No, it's not the first boner. This is the first time... We've seen uh, Family Ties, but it is not the first time we've seen the Family Ties house. Growing Pains. Family Ties, different show. Sorry, yeah, we were talking about Family yeah. Ties earlier. Uh, growing <laughs> Pains. It's not the first time we've seen the Growing Pains house. That is true. Yeah. Oh, it's the house from Cooper, right? Hanging with Mr. Cooper. Yeah. Because Hanging with Mr. Cooper on that first episode, it was like that passing of the oh, torch where he was- right. They had that weird scene where it's just him and Alan Thicke, <laughs> and he was like, they were playing themselves. Like, yeah. it was, it it was, was just weird-, weird. It was like a meta thing, <laughs> but yeah, it was it was the kind of the passing of the torch for the time slot, and they literally used the same house for the same episode, for the first episode at least. That house is set up so weird. It really is. Their front door is just you're in like a screen house, but there's no wall, and then it's just into the house. Like they have eaves in their living room. Yeah, it's like they're in the attic, but in their living. It's so fucking weird. <laughs> There's a scene later on where one of the many horny scenes of this episode where you think they're in the attic and you realize they're yes. in the living room yeah. because it doesn't make any sense architecturally. Yeah, and also they're in New York, so like the screened-in thing is like it's too cold for that. They're supposed to yeah. like Massapequa <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? No, but that's a greenhouse, so that's. Yeah, but that's their warm. front door, and there's no a greenhouse is usually glass on all four sides. It's just goes right into their house. Yeah, but if it goes into their house, then that would mean that the heat would radiate inside. I guess so it wouldn't so, be but... that weird of a, like, not that weird. I would think that's... I would say not common architecture, though. Not something you no. see in a lot of houses. No, no, I think I've only seen one in my entire life. And then to get into it real quick, Rotten Tomatoes, no scores, which I thought, obviously critic scores are tough when it's an older show, but a little surprised there was no audience score for that one and then imdb had like a average rating of 6.6 .6 for the series as a whole oddly the show came out on like the full series dvd came out like a couple months ago oh really <laughs> yeah it was one of those weird shows where like at the height at the height of like you know tv show dvds a lot of these shows got like one or two seasons put out but for some reason they never did like a whole series and it just came out so now i'm like fuck next time i'm at like walmart or whatever i'm gonna be like I guess we're watching all of Growing Pains now. 
I wonder if there was like rights issues or something, like different networks only different parts. They had to settle the estate of Boner. Does this have <laughs> any um streamers? I didn't see where it was streaming. I mean, I would assume it's on Freebie. Everything seems to be on Freebie now. <laughs> Tubi, Tubi's really gone downhill. <laughs> Tubi, I think Tubi pays people. What I heard from somebody recently was that Freebie is set up in a way that there's no, like it's a loophole where there's no royalties paid. Oh, it's like if ECW was a channel. Yeah. So a bunch of stuff is getting on there. When you see a bunch of stuff on Amazon Freebie, it's because Bezos won't cough up the money to pay these people any of their money, which makes me hope that another reason why I'm like, I'm going to go buy this box set so that I can give the estate of Boner 37 cents. I'm looking now and it doesn't appear to be available on anything that you don't have to pay. Like it has like it's on Amazon Prime for one ninety nine, Apple TV one ninety nine. Voodoo 199. It's not even on any of the free ones. Interesting for a show that was like this big that had this much of a run on a major network. Yeah. With big stars in it. What well, what network was this on? ABC? This was ABC. Yeah, cuz this is um TJF era. That's why they didn't throw it on Disney Plus. Yeah. Pull us old people in. Maybe they'll put put it on Disney Plus at some point. I, I wouldn't be shocked if one day, especially if we just got a DVD release like who knows, maybe it's a distribution rights issue but I guarantee it will go it will go on Disney Plus the day I buy the DVD box set. That is the way this <laughs> usually happens. I will spend $45 or whatever on it and then it'll be free to stream and I'll never open it. Does anybody actually watch DVDs besides Joe? Like does any No. Now no. no. I can't no. tell you the last time I physically watched a DVD. A lot of people do. There's a lot of labels out there, like like distributing labels out there who put out tons of stuff, who put out like limited editions and like Tons yeah, of bonus features. For collectors. Yeah, but they sell out. They put out like 10,000 copies and they sell out. And that's not a ton of people, but like I bought that Bret Hitman Heart Wrestling with Shadows and I got the like limited slipcover edition. And it sold out in like a week. Like it's people buy them, people watch them. But no, Ferg's right. It's a lot of collectors. It's a lot of people, like especially something like that, like wrestling, which had such a strong collector base. They're buying it to own it. But just like that Macho Man album just came out on Record Store Day, I guarantee you a small, small fraction of those will ever be opened. Oh, yeah, it'll be, like, framed or just be, like, in... Yeah, just held or, like, put on a shelf somewhere for display. I appreciate having such weird stuff like that still, though, that, like, this, there's a store here that stocks all the new titles from all those, like, kind of boutique Blu-ray companies and everything. And sometimes you'll buy something, it'll be totally great. Sometimes you'll pay $24. I bought something the other day that was, like, L.A. Vengeance or something, and it was, like, actors from Baywatch Nights from, like, 1993, <laughs> and it was, like... Maybe the worst movie I've ever seen. Uh, my wife fell asleep 10 minutes into it. Like, that's how bad it was. And she was like, I'm fucking checking out. I can't even watch this. And it took me two years to get you to watch Forgetting Sarah Marshall. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd rather watch something that was an action movie with people from Baywatch Nights in it. That's much more my speed. <laughs> all right. And just to tell everyone real quick, S1E1Pod.com is where you can find all the links to where you can listen to us and our social medias. S1E1Pod on Twitter and Instagram. That's where you're most likely going to be able to reach us. If you want to communicate hit us up we uh we like hearing from you guys we like hearing about how you found us shows you want us to cover things like that so go ahead and give us a message on either of those before we start can we just reference or talk about we've referenced it a few times but boner can we mention boner that's a very early s1e1 story here who's boner there it yeah is. <laughs> one of our first tracking lines yeah from from the early episodes gordo said that in that way but earnestly had no idea what we meant and still doesn't really when we, no, when I we don't. talked about Boner, yeah. No, I don't at all. <laughs> so Boner is the best friend of Mike for a couple of seasons in this, which I didn't know until doing research for this. His name is Richard. I knew his last name was Stabone. That's like why he's named Boner. But his name is Richard Milhouse. So they gave him Richard Nixon's first and middle name, which is interesting. Wait, is his name Boner on the show? His yes. nickname is Boner. Yeah. His name is Richard. He's Stabone. referred to by everyone on the show as Boner, the same way that you would hear people mention Urkel or anywhere anyone else. Or like the way your last name is Gordon, and we call you Gordo. You just docked Gordo. That's, that was not a tough one. His nickname is one letter off from what his actual name is. I could have been Gordovsky. <laughs> <laughs> Mikhail Gordovsky. <laughs> Gordo's going to flee to the Eastern Bloc to try to get away from us. <laughs> uh, he's right, though. He could have been Gordovsky. Joe, did you ever see the um, 
fan film with boner um when he plays the joker yeah i've seen a lot of fan films with boners <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i'll give that to you yeah i can't fight that one <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah he played the joker and got killed by a predator it's batman dead end right mm-hmm. yes yep. yeah that was really good yeah He's actually a really good Joker in that, too, yeah. It's an excellent Joker. They had an awesome makeup job on him. And then, sadly, he, he passed a few years later in unfortunate circumstances. Yeah, he unfortunately, he took his life in, like, I don't know, just, it was around 2015-ish, 2014, somewhere around that time. But I remember it was in the news, and that's why the boner thing, I think, maybe came up initially, because they were like, that was his most famous thing, where they were like, <laughs> The CNN headline was like, Boner missing in Vancouver. And you were like, guys, give the guy some respect. This poor guy's dead. Come on. I was still already laughing at the Boner thing came up. <laughs> it's such like a New York, was it New York Daily News, Nick, that we saw was good at the gas station? Yeah, yeah. Where all the headlines are like, I'm a lucky man, says guy shot in face with dick. You're like, all right, everybody, <laughs> let's, let's cool it out a little bit. Yeah, he, uh, he died in 2010. Oh, that was longer ago than I realized. I yeah, thought it yeah, was more too. recent. And that Batman Dead End came out in 2003. Yeah, I feel like we got a VHS of that and a VHS of that crazy Spider-Man movie at one of the Comic-Cons. I yeah, remember I'm... seeing that for the first time. We were at that Wizard World. Yes. Yeah. The one that you got in for free. Yeah, that's when, like, the big thing at comic book conventions, I mean, it, it, DVDs at that point, but even before with VHS tapes, or like weird bootleg fan films and when you would still like when streaming didn't really exist. So if, you know, you had like bootleg of movies in theaters, like getting them on DVD and VHS tapes were like the biggest deal. And you'd always find them at like comic book conventions. Yeah, it was before there was like celebrities there. Like you'd meet like comic book writers, but that was it. There wasn't like any reveals or anything or like big actors at those then. Thinking back with the videotape thing, like I remember you would if you bought Something I remember buying Jurassic Park 3 at a comic book convention when it was still in theaters, <laughs> like on a VHS tape. And like it was like voodoo to people when you explained it like, yeah, I have a tape and it's still in theaters. Yeah. I remember, too, though, they would always smartly have the little TV with the VCR in it. And you'd ask them, be like, can you play this copy for 10 seconds? Because you didn't want to pay 30 bucks for a blank VHS tape. And like, Oh, yeah. Even like, now, oh, like the idea that some people bootleg movies that old way where they just bring like a camera or a phone into a movie theater and record it. No, it was a camcorder. It wasn't even a, a they didn't have phones. To no, do I'm that. saying now they still do it, though. And people will do it with just like a phone or something. But but yeah, bringing camcorders and like a whole tripod set up in an empty yeah, theater. The, the difference is nowadays they're like super advanced, like HD cameras, and they're about like the size of my fist. Yeah. Keep yeah. them sturdy. The last one I remember seeing that was that bad was I forget what movie it was. It did the opening of The Dark Knight Returns, but the first 10 minutes were before some movie. And it was a movie I didn't want to see, and I wasn't <laughs> gonna pay 20 bucks to go see it. So I like found a download of somebody had like shakily got it with their camera in the movie theater because this was only 10 years ago or whatever and i'm kind of sad i never saved the file because that's before they changed bane's voice because like they put that out and everybody was like what the fuck is that guy saying because it was back when he like was completely inaudible or just like rrr, 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 rrr. i was gonna say the corrected version wasn't it wasn't significantly better no rrr, Batman. i hate that voice yeah so much <laughs> but uh yeah we might as well get into the actual episode itself Starts interesting. It it has like the intro is a like an intro to the show. Like they they kind of giving you a. It's not a scene. It's like this weird, almost mini commercial for the show, and it's just kind of voiceover work of, you know, the two parents on the show, Maggie and Jason C- uh, Seaver, and they're just kind of this is a back and forth where they tell you their occupations. Maggie's going back to work. Yeah. <laughs> so- <laughs> And we have great kids most of the time. <laughs> it's so unnecessary because they explain everything. Like, he's like, Maggie's going back to work, and that's going to be tough. Five minutes in the episode. Mom, why did you go back to work? Like, we didn't need this opening. Yeah. They explain it in the show. Yeah, yeah, you can. Everything they explain you here was, I think, pretty well laid out in the episode itself. I think it's it's a brand new show. And if someone's watching something else and the show just comes on. You have very little time to hook them before they change the channel. So back then, like, there's not as many trail like commercials and TV spots for shows. 
So maybe you just show them this is something you don't want to watch. Like <laughs> This like device to introduce you to the show, how do you feel about it? Because I don't think we've seen this on any other episode we've covered. It's weird and I don't like it. I didn't like it. Yeah. I, I liked it only for the fact that you probably only would have known at this time Alan Thicke for doing Thick of the Night, where you knew him as a talk show host. So him doing a talk show host sort of intro, I think in this one case made sense. Like if it was like, Johnny Carson stars in my four kids or whatever. You'd be like, well, I expect him to do this or like Letterman or Leno or whoever. But I think it's a bad device otherwise. Yeah, I liked it in a way where it felt nostalgic. Like it just felt like it was the 80s watching it because it wouldn't be done today. But I don't think it was necessary. I think it was a fine TV spot. If that was just like a commercial, it's the fact that it came Agreed. on right before exactly what we were going to see. It right. Was, the thing in it was scenes from the actual episode. Right, because like, you see Mike airing. in jail, and you're like, that'll be a fun episode. And they're like, hold on, 18 <laughs> minutes, and you'll find yeah. out more. Do you think that was a commercial? That Because sometimes they used to do that back in the day. They used to play these commercials, and then they could slot the commercial right before the television show. No, I think it's part of the pilot. It's a good question, actually, but I think it's part of the pilot, yeah. I think it's part of the pilot. They might have used that cut for on-air like spots on television to promo the show but i think it was used deliberately here as part of the episode i will say though crazy to think when you watch some of these shows sometimes i know we complained about the long shows right this one was what 24 minutes i think yeah it had like an extra minute or so which is probably yeah. largely in part to this this was about like i think it was like 50 something seconds that intro ran right but you think of that now you're like they would never let a show go that long on a non-streamer because of the amount of commercials they try to push into everything now. Like, you right. could never make a TV show 24 minutes. It's like 18.50 now. And then right after that little kind of intro thing, we get the theme song. And this, again, I feel like one of the most iconic theme songs. Like, it's up yeah. there. So the theme song is great. The The visual that goes along with it is colossally stupid. That is it's not a visual cheers. I remember. What are they trying to do? Because it seems like they're trying to like, show you families through time, right? So my note that I wrote to myself in this was clearly a placeholder intro. Yeah, because the one I remember, it's pictures of them as a baby and a them dog. growing and, up. And, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So I feel like this was probably a pilot-only intro where they just use those old-timey photos. But clearly done because of Cheers. Oh, for sure. I, I, I don't know if I would say directly because of Cheers. This is, this is like an exact reproduction of what the Cheers intro is. Now, visually. Some of the art in it is. Not all of it, though. What, what year was Cheers? I think 82 it starts, 82 or 83. So yeah, they've been at the height of their popularity. Yeah, so they're a big show already. And this song, too. This is one of the few times we get a show where there's like, like Welcome Back, Cotter. We get like a big star singing it, too. Who sang, sang this? this? Uh, this is BJ Thomas, the guy like raindrops keep falling on my head. And then the duet version that comes in later is Jennifer Warrens, who does um, love lift us up where, where we belong. belong. <laughs> and then they released it as an actual single in 89. when they were like, shit, we forgot to release this as a record for four years. People love this song. And it's all of them and Dusty Springfield. It's like fucking crazy. There's a record that it's growing pains and like other theme songs, but it's like th that's the title no, the... there's a single. Oh, I was going to say, I saw a vinyl copy that was, like, multiple tracks on it. There's a 7-inch that was released in, like, four different countries. Two in the okay. U.S., one with a picture sleeve of The Growing Pains, and it's that version. It's the B.J. Thomas with Dusty Springfield with Jennifer Warrens and the guy who wrote it. Got it. I assume it's a much longer version than the TV intro. No, I think, yeah, they wrote it out to, like, four minutes, and I think the other side is an instrumental. I listened to it on YouTube. You can find the full version on there. I'm doing that later. It's a great song. It's, uh, <laughs> Let's just pause and listen to it right now. All right. Show me that smile again. Show me that smile. Don't waste another minute on your crying. That's all I'm giving you. <laughs> I don't know the lyrics. I know the melody. I do not know the lyrics. To the I have the lyrics now. written, so I could go through the whole thing, but I'm not going. Let's give us one chorus, big guy. Yeah. <laughs> We're nowhere near the end. Nowhere the nowhere best the is end. ready to begin. As long as we've got each other. Do -do 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 -do. We got the world spinning <laughs> right in our hands. That's it. Rain the rest you'll have to pay me. All the time. 
<laughs> We've got each other sharing, sharing the laughter, laughter and love. Cool. I don't know math anymore, but yeah. that shit just comes right back in the brain. <laughs> you guys, you guys kept uh, singing more than I was like felt compelled to keep going. I was like, all right, I'm done. And then you Such sucked me right back song. in. <laughs> it, it is a great, it's song. A great song. I do feel that this is um because I, I think so highly of that intro. I feel like if if this show was more available and on a popular streamer and people were still watching it. Like, I feel like it would be higher up in people's memories, but... You know what? Based on that theme song, Green Light. Let's move on, boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone, I'm going to bed. I'll see you later. Uh, this would be a good karaoke song, though. It would be an excellent If you know that, yeah, song. until you sing... Until you go to select it and like, oh, yeah, we have it. And it's the four-minute version. <laughs> and then it's all That's these other tough. words. Yeah, and... you want the, you want um, the minute long. Yeah. It's like, everyone's really excited for the first 30 seconds. And now everyone who's singing along is just kind of looking at you confused. <laughs> <laughs> like Gordo not making any comment, thinking about every time I watched him in karaoke do Paradise by the Dashboard Light, which is like 17 and a half minutes long. It would just clear out the bar that was there. <laughs> I can't believe you you would do a meatloaf song at karaoke. <laughs> the stamina on you. I can't believe you wouldn't do Wonderwall and just sing the chorus seven times. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. That well, happens. <laughs> there is a little wrong with that. That's... Not quite how I mean, the song is. It is a great chorus. I mean, we're not going to lie here. They don't end the song. They end it on the chorus. Yeah, but you started middle and ended it on the chorus. <laughs> yeah, you just didn't know that there were verses or a bridge <laughs> is the problem. <laughs> the first scene, we have uh, the mom, Maggie, and she's singing in the kitchen while making breakfast. And, and the two youngest kids are there, Carol and Ben. Ages for them. So we know Mike, who shows up later, is 15 because it comes up. I assume they're... Carol's probably a couple of years younger he's, than he, him, they, maybe in the Ben's 13 probably age. like seven, eight. Yeah, maybe like 13 and eight, maybe somewhere in that range for yeah, those two. Like, yeah, eight, 12, 15, somewhere in that neighborhood. And now I saw it. I didn't pick up on it watching it, but then later on reading my note, uh, reading notes on the show, I saw it. Do you, did you guys see what she was humming in the you first? You know, I did, and I didn't pick up on it either. I didn't pick up on it. She, yeah, she was humming the theme to Who's the Boss? Was she? I didn't realize that. No, I didn't get I'm that. I'm so upset with myself for not noticing. Yeah, I just, it, it was just one of those, I didn't pick up on it, and then when I'm reading it, I watched it back. I was like, oh my god, it is. It's so random. Like, Did we cover Who's the Boss? Did we not do that yet? We haven't no. yet. Need to. We've talked no. about it a million times. Oh my god. We talk about Mona all night long. Oh god. Speaking oh. of horny characters, Mona. <laughs> Mona is a classic horny <laughs> character. And I did, I, I wanted to bring up the house. You guys kind of talked about it to start the episode. Because this kitchen is gigantic, the way that it's set up. That house is 90% kitchen. It's all kitchen. <laughs> it's a huge kitchen. And it's like a two-story ceiling. Like, usually, like, obviously, there's, like, these are studios. So, like, usually you try to shoot it in a way that doesn't make it look like it's a 20-foot ceiling. Yeah, but... like there's no end to the... Yeah. It's hard to heat that house. No, that's why they got the uh, the greenhouse as their, their front well, door. Well, between the greenhouse and the libido is in this. So there's heat all through this. So the Seaver family live in Biodome. <laughs> you fuck President Clinton? Cool. <laughs> Purple Sticky Punch or Hemp. <laughs> what does that say to you? We're out of beer? Uh, and I, I hate again that we could just pull up fucking Biodome quotes. I Listen, I'm a man who admittedly, and no, no shade on any of you who do, most of this panel here. I've never in my life smoked the devil's lettuce. It's just not my thing. Evident by the fact that he calls it the devil's lettuce. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, tell <laughs> yeah. us by not telling us, Jay. I've never smoked the pot, but um, <laughs> I've watched Biodome maybe 50 times in my life. I love that movie so much. I still think it's not as good as uh, Son-in-Law, but it's a, it's a fun movie. Definitely not as good as Encino Man. Encino Man is also... I love Encino Man. I love Encino Man because I feel like... if. I mean, we've pitched before. I've pitched before. We. I'm not going <laughs> to drag any of you guys down here before. But I've pitched numerous times that there should be the movie Father-in-Law, where we remake or you know have a sequel to Son-in-Law. But I feel like you could actually get the people to do an Encino Man, sequel. especially with Brendan Fraser's Fraser's uh, like come up and recently. Right. Like you get him. Sean Astin was just in Stranger Things. He's been in a few things actually, and Pauly yeah. Shore. I mean, is still. Polly Shore is sitting by his phone waiting for calls. Hey, I love Polly Shore. He's still touring. He's still doing stuff. Polly Shore is fine. I think he's just like, I don't know. I mean, 
he's just gonna be Polly Shore and everything from now on, unless they did something like this. It would just be strange because he's such a product of the '90s. Like to have him in something now, it would be very strange. There was a good run where we were mentioning Polly Shore for like every episode for like a few months. It was just for whatever reason, Polly Shore just just you kept. Think we could up. get him on. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, he has a show, right? There, w- there was a Polly Shore show. Was it called Polly or the Polly so, Shore yeah. show? I thought it was. Called I think it was Pauly. just called Polly. Is it still running? No, no. <laughs> no this is like in the. Oh, 90s. I thought you were talking about now. No, 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 no. no. So yeah, maybe if we ever cover it, we could we could try to slide in the DMs. While Maggie's sitting in the kitchen singing and cooking breakfast, this is when Jason runs up. What was that? Like an, the egg beater thing? I don't know what that's called. The little spinning whisk, whisk thing. A whisk. Yeah. But like the spinning one, the one where you could like crank it. Oh, that's a hand mixer. Uh, yeah, it's just like a hand mixer. It's a hand mixer. Yeah, I think it's just it's a hand, hand mixer. mixer. Yeah. The one that's on the 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 electric vish, vish, the two of them no but yeah but the, the hand crank like version the crank of it, yeah. version of it yeah yeah it's still a hand it's still a hand mixer so regardless yeah he grabs one of those and he runs up and he's like all right lady drop that spatula or you're scrambled <laughs> this is like a this couple is very horny uh him in particular but yeah they just start kissing like right away in the kitchen with like the kids in there and stuff and this is prime example of one of those does not imitate real life because they even discuss that his nine o'clock appointment is far away at this point because he still needed to do paperwork before it and everything. So what is it? It's like seven thirty in the morning. Nobody is like that at seven thirty in the morning. Everybody's dressed, ready to go. She's cooking this big breakfast. It's everybody's hat. It's like it's so. I fucking hate when TV shows do. He's it. wearing it's a sweater. Real. Nobody wears a yeah. sweater at seven thirty in the <laughs> yeah, morning. Like, just does not happen. Well, she's saying, like, hey, not in front of the kids. And he had, he mentions that he had just read an article saying that two career couples should, you know, go out of their way to stay frisky. Look, I agree with that, but not. So I can see him being like a psychiatrist who's like reading up on modern art. Like it like I could see that all making sense for his character on top of him just being a naturally horny guy. Yeah, but here's the issue I have. Right. If you're if you want to get to it during the day. The kids are gone from like 8 to 2.30. They're all at school. The house is empty. So anytime he doesn't have a patient and she has a day off from the newspaper, they have the entire day. You wouldn't be like, the kids haven't left yet. Let me start feeling you up. That seems unnecessary. And I was going to ask, did you guys grow up in houses where like you had affectionate parents? Because like, no, thanks for bringing it up. Well, I was no. going to say, mine, no. Like my parents, <laughs> my parents hated each other. <laughs> my whole life until they split up like they there wasn't a i didn't watch like that love slowly dissolve like they were never like they never liked each other that much to begin with so like i didn't know like maybe there are houses where that's common where parents are loving i don't know it is it can be common it is never common at 7 30 in the morning though it's just not like I, i i don't know why this bugs me so much i hate morning rituals or routines on TV shows like this because they're so unbelievable. Because you're slinging the kids cereal, making them stuff. You're trying to get to work. It's yeah, it's too hectic of a time. My my only argument is, and, and this varies from person to person. I'm a morning guy, so when I wake up, I'm pretty good to go right away. So I don't I don't look at mornings that weird as like how would he even be like I don't know. Once I'm up, I'm up. So maybe that's it. Doesn't flag me the same way it does you guys. I'm similar. I get up early, even on the weekends. I'm not a late sleeper. I feel like if I sleep late, I've wasted the day. I can't. I'm not one of those people who can sleep even past. I can't even sleep till nine, like eight, eight thirty. I feel like I've slept in a crazy amount of time. I have to be up, but I still just want to like get up, get coffee and kind of like start the day. I don't feel like I want to be like walk a walk. I can I can point. respect getting up early. Uh, I don't do it unless like I have to for the I mean, I do get up kind of early now but kind of early for me is like getting out of bed before 10 don't you get super tired later in the, like saturday morning you're really up at like 7 30 in the morning eight o'clock in Every the morning week. yeah and then what how are you feeling at four like last saturday 7 30 in the morning i am on my kitchen couch 
uh, my kitchen couch. My kitchen, <laughs> my living room couch. Mr. Kitchen couch. You must live in the Seaver house, yeah, yeah, with that giant kitchen. <laughs> we had gone and gotten coffee. I was, like, sitting with a coffee from a store watching the news at, like, 7.30. And at 4 o'clock, I was absolutely fine. I might have been drunk, but I was fine. <laughs> you wouldn't have needed that coffee if you got the adequate amount of sleep. Well, the coffee, I think, is more just when you wake up, it's a ritual. You have to have it. It depends. I'll see. I'm a... We've had the coffee talk, and Ferg, I'll spare you the coffee talk, but... Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm someone who legit enjoys it, so even like when I switch to decaf, I still like Agreed. to have a coffee in the morning, even though it doesn't physically do coffee things Same, to me anymore. for the most part, yeah. And uh, at this point, this is when their oldest son, Mike, walks in, and he starts by just like, what's the matter? You guys aren't getting enough? Like, <laughs> So <laughs> weird. <laughs> It's a weird first intro to this character. So I guess like them being affectionate in front of the kids is very common because it doesn't even, it's not even, I don't know. That's nothing I would have ever said to my parents at any age. At least horny Frank had like, they would sneak away and be horny. Like they just do it right in front of the kids. I was going to bring this up. Who's more horny? Horny Frank or horny Jason? So I thought about this. I think there's a, a, a difference and I'll explain it. Frank is horny the whole time. Whereas (laughs) Whereas <laughs> it doesn't dissipate. Uh, Jason is kind of like in bursts horny it, like a couple times. So I think Frank is hornier in general. And a clue you guys in listening, we're talking about Frank from Step by Step, which we covered a long time. If you want to go back and listen, actually, one of my favorite episodes we've recorded was Step by Step. It's one of our best ones. And Patrick Duffy is. is a very horny character. Yeah. In and that you show. can go back and listen to it. But just to kind of summarize, my, my opinion on that is. Frank was, like, going against all logic, didn't give a fuck about his kids. Like, everything invited these people into the house. Everything was for the sake of getting laid. Like, his whole life was being spun upside down, and no logic mattered. He just wanted to fuck fuck this girl. Yeah. (laughs) Well, Horny Frank, though, also was in honeymoon mode, legitimately. Yeah. Whereas Horny Jason just loves his wife. Yeah. (laughs) I guess it's like, you know, it's a very different situation. So, here's my theory. Horny Frank is never gets it during the run of the TV show. That's well, he why he's horny. It. No, he doesn't. He doesn't they get it. They just came back from Island Paradise where they fucked the whole time. Yeah. But I'm not watching the pilot in Island Paradise. I'm watching Horny Frank try and chase after his new bride, whereas we can make the assumption that Jason Seaver got it, you know, laid pipe a couple of times during that episode. Um, I'm still, I still think Frank's a different level of horny. Yeah. Frank's just a different <laughs> level of horny person. You're just saying a lot of words that aren't yeah. really making sense right now, Gordo. Listen, you could go back to the tape. That makes sense. I love when you say go back to the tape because that means we, uh, we will. We often do. Will be yeah. so good. <laughs> you just gave us a clip of proving you wrong. Get, all right. No, no, no. I, I'm serious. Give that another shot. I'm not saying you're, you're wrong. I'm saying I don't understand what you're saying. The horny, you so... We are all in agreement that Horny Frank is more hornier. Okay. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, he is more hornier. <laughs> yes. So because he has a sustained horniness, that means that he didn't get any because he still is okay, on that I, same horny. I see what you're saying, actually, and it does make sense, yeah. Whereas Jason Seaver gets it in bursts, so that means that he can just pump it you know a couple what I, of times you, you know day. what I was trying to say? We Because of the episode time span, even though he's fresh off of getting laid, we're seeing horny Frank at a point where there's no post-nut clarity throughout the entire episode. Correct. Cor- correct. Yeah, he tries and fails a few times during this. He yeah. has a lot of stress going on. So in his throughout life. that period of the week or so, yeah, there's no point where he's getting any in that time frame to our knowledge. Whereas the Seavers may have, you know, had a little romp right before they went to bed. Yeah, but with that logic, we didn't see the Seavers fuck either. So that's true, right? But you did see, you did see him not be horny. Yes. I see him throw pajamas around and maybe hit his wife off screen, but I don't know. <laughs> 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 the director's cut that fur. When we get to the pot, I'll tell you. What are we'll pajamas? Get, we'll get to that. <laughs> How did you guys feel about um, after when Jason says to Mike, like, you know, a lot of kids would have got smacked for a mark like that. And he's like, come on, dad, you can't hit me. You're a liberal humanist. Like, that's not how kids talk. <laughs> no, that's not. <laughs> no. No. It's funny. Somebody mentioned, uh, Nick mentioned Family Ties earlier. I thought this was almost like reactionary to Alex P. Keaton's character that was very popular at the time because his character was such a, like, 
like the whole joke of it was like i'm a young republican dad so i feel like this was yeah. like a very play the opposite side of it thing and maybe that was like a nod to it if that makes sense i feel like i've watched a lot of both shows and i would always confuse the two by namesake not by like yeah, I just did it. It's it's easy. Yeah, because I mean they're just really I mean, similar. They're both vibes. mics. <laughs> they existed too, yeah. around the same time. Similar family structure. A lot of that stuff. Did you guys see? Um, they cut over and Ben's watching like the super old portable TV. And I remember like we had one. We had one in my house. In I had it, one. It, it, we like it's like oh it's for when we're out in the yard or at barbecues right. and stuff and it, but they like always work like shit so it's like it's a five no inch point screen them. it's black and white yeah. it weighs a thousand pounds in movies and tv shows those always exist and always work immaculately in reality you're just looking at fuzz <laughs> yeah i remember nick had one i had yeah i did have one. i had a color one too which yes. they were usually black and white and i had a color one that again like it didn't really work where you wanted it to work like out in the middle of nowhere People of the old rabbit ears. <laughs> but I thought that it was a radio, in all honesty. I didn't get it. You didn't notice it. It, it, it was, was a radio with it. pictures. Yeah. It's a no, moving picture the, screen. <laughs> the way that it was positioned. In front of his face for viewing pleasure. You don't know. He could be stupid and looking at the radio dial. Like, what else are you going to do in the 80s? Like, <laughs> it's... It's the 80s. It's the 1980s, not the this 1880s. Wasn't like, what are you talking about? <laughs> My thing was like, this is not interpretive. We saw him watch the television. Like, it's, it's, it's visual. We saw it happen. I, yeah, Gordo just looked away and decided he needed to argue this. <laughs> no, he was looking at it, and it was a side, and it looked like one of those like portable radios with the little antenna on it the top. Had a and screen. a big, obvious screen that he was screen. staring no. at. Which is the big thing that yes. differs a radio from a television. <laughs> Gordon, the fact that 80% of us saw a picture screen yeah. and 20% didn't, I think is enough to say that you got to move on from this one. <laughs> Never did see me a Flickr show. <laughs> oh. Aww. I tried to get the TV. I tried to take it back. <laughs> when Jason was like, what's so funny, Ben? He's like, that Phil is George. She screwed up again. I had to like, I don't know if you guys did any homework on that after. I'm like, who no, the fuck is George? No, because I knew George? you would. Nope. I knew Joe would know anyway. So my no, so, so. At the end of the day, Phyllis George ended up being known. She was like a like a Miss America contestant, but she ended up becoming like a ESPN like sports anchor. I don't know if it was ESPN, but she was a sports anchor uh, for years. But before that, she was on like regular like CBS Morning News, and she had a situation that happened in May of '85, which was a few months before this aired, where she was interviewing um, a rape victim and her assailant who was like fresh out of jail, and they were doing like a big like peace for the morning and she was trying to encourage the two to like hug it out on television and it was awkward as fuck and like didn't happen like she was this girl's not gonna hug the guy who raped her on tv and um <laughs> i that was like the big thing that pops up when you try to look her up and uh it had to be a reference to that situation her daughter now is a cnn like weekend anchor too oh is she really I, that i didn't know yeah I really hope Ben was watching that segment. It's like ben was watching it being like, segment. the news is weird. Well, I mean, to be fair, it's 7 in the morning. It's probably what he was watching. It's like the morning show. You only get the UHF channels, right? Yeah. Well, if he's watching TV that early in the morning through rabbit ears. No, but I, but I think it was a radio. So, um, <laughs> he's, listening to, he's listening to drive time yeah. radio. He's listening to the weather. Yeah. And then, uh, so now we see Mike on the phone. And he's he's making plans. Uh, he wants to go to a place called what was it again? It's the House of Sweat. House of yeah. Sweat. House of Sweat. So I did some research of this too. Did you know that there's currently two LLC Houses of Sweat active? Oh, really? There's one in Orlando and one in Ontario. Are these both under? 20 dance clubs no they're both physical fitness centers okay that makes more sense <laughs> yeah and then if you want to know like you know how sometimes you get stuck in a rabbit hole looking for stuff and the google search term just won't allow you to break out of what it thinks it is mm -hmm. typing in house of sweat shirt because i was trying to find <laughs> like does one of those shirt. places <laughs> sell a shirt because i was gonna buy one for each of us so we could all have house of sweat shirts but everything is just like, do you mean a sweatshirt for the show house? Like, it's like it doesn't <laughs> like sweat and shirt together. just keeps fucking with you. I had to give I'd up. take that too, Joe. I yeah, would too. If you're still buying. <laughs> I 
can buy us a bunch of expensive like crew sweatshirts. You say that now, and then when we do, five. when we end up doing like our Christmas like not so secret Santa, you're gonna end up just getting a house sweatshirt and have to be like, oh nice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, hey, if you don't love Hugh Laurie and the wonderful I show House. I fucking love House. I do yeah, love House. House is amazing. I don't know if I want to represent it in sweatshirt form, but. I mean, it's better to represent it in that than when that show was on and you'd go to like a, like a Spencer's Gift or whatever. And all the stuff for House was like, is it lupus? You're like, that's not a funny <laughs> shirt. Right. Like all the House branded stuff just said, I bet it's lupus. Like, it's an awful thing. It's a terrible <laughs> disease. <laughs> To go back to the club thing, do you, I remember there was not far from us. There was that like under twenty one club that all the kids went to. Oh, Mac Two's. No, that was also the, under twenty one. Um, it's the Palace of Perspiration. Palace. Yeah, uh, I never went. Did any of you guys ever go to those? Wait, was it really called that, the Palace of Perspiration? No, just the Palace. The palace. <laughs> oh, was it really called the Palace? Once. I was making a joke. Yeah, it was the Palace. I, I don't know if I've been. No, I don't even awesome. remember that. That was no. an awesome scene. Yeah, it wasn't I, far from us, but... So they started doing shows there, and some kids who were in, like, a band, some kids that we did not get along with who had a band a couple years older than us, were playing there one night, and, like, a bunch of us were hanging out, and I was completely blackout drunk, and I woke up, and I was like, where are we? And they were like, at the palace, seeing so-and-so, and I was like, put me back in, I'm not done yet. I just, like, went back out to the minivan and kept drinking. Is that the place next to town line? Yes. Yeah, it was near there. It, it was. wasn't. It wasn't the place like connected to it, but yeah, it was in that area. For okay, those of I you who are regional that. listeners. Yeah, and then years later, I saw Striper at the building it became. Oh, nice. <laughs> I was looking it up. So this, they, they said this was an under twenty dance club. I will say, at the time of this episode, in nineteen eighty five, the drinking age of New York was still nineteen. Now it was raised to twenty one later that year in December. But at the time, if you had an under-20 dance club, there would have been older kids there who could have brought in alcohol pretty easily. And you were grandfathered in, because I remember my parents talking to me about that, because the, they lowered the drinking age to 18 around 1980 And yeah, my mother got grandfathered in. It depended on, yeah, yeah, so every state was a little different. So I had to look at like a state-by-state -state breakdown to figure out New York specifically. That's why they had that weird 19 thing. It went from 18 to 19 and then to 21. Yeah, so if you were... 18 when it happened in massachusetts and then it jumped to 21 they let you still drink for three years which is kind of amazing you can go to war but you can't drink i mean that was a big issue too because in the like, like during vietnam the national age to vote was 21 and the national age to go to war and drink was 18 and that caused like a huge stir people were just like you can't go to war if you can't vote for policy like that yeah. sort of thing so it's just a weird thing like everything's probably never gonna change now i still hear people bring similar stuff up now like oh you can go to war but you can't have a beer like it's a it's a weird yeah. line that we draw i mean if i got drafted i'd be pretty pissed about it personally you'd want to get drafted yeah yeah me and spuds mckenzie would be fighting it out <laughs> from my understanding <laughs> and this is just how i've heard it and i've never talked to anyone of any real importance about the situation but from what I understand, the thought process was it got raised from 18 to 21 because they know people younger acquire alcohol. So when you make it 21, they're like, okay, odds of 18-year-olds finding alcohol pretty easy, pretty good. When you have it at 18, that's when even younger kids start easily acquiring. So it's really like to raise it to 21 is not to keep 18-year-olds from drinking, more so keeping 14 and 15-year-olds from drinking. Not that that works either. <laughs> Never stopped us, eh, boys? As I say, that's part of the mindset. <laughs> and if you know people, I mean, everybody out here has, who drank as a teenager, if you know people, you find it. It's not like it was ever hard. This was a time, though, when everything was changing, too, because, like, I mean, the, the, limit, uh, the speed limit getting moved to 55 was a big thing around this time, too, right? Like, that caused, like... I can't drive Songs 55. T-shirts and stuff, yeah. They're making a lot of different changes to the laws. And then right around this time in the episode is when all the kids are about to, like, head out because it's time for school. I think the bus is coming and everyone's taking off. And all the kids leave. And, and now Jason's telling his wife that he had some paperwork to do before it's 9 o'clock gets there. But if uh, by any chance he's starting to feel frisky and has 8 to 10 seconds before work, uh, <laughs> he's available. My man. Alan Thick, more like Alan Quick. Am I right, guys? Ew, Ew, thick wait. and quick. And um, now Ben, he takes off, and now Ben walks back in, the youngest son, and he's sad. And basically, 
he recently acquired a boo-boo and he was not happy with the way that his dad took care of it. Maggie goes to look at it and it's like, oh, you got your Superman bandage. Like, he, d- dad did a great job. But he forgot to, I don't know, kiss up his entire arm like <laughs> it's Morticia Adams. <laughs> she gives him like the full like wrist to shoulder kisses. It's much better if, if fucking Alan Thicke with a mustache and was like, <laughs> me <"Mia> more. Yeah. <laughs> Just kissing up Ben's arm. I did like, um, this is again, though, not how kids talk. But then Ben's like, it was also clinical. Wait, See, my, my issue with this is they just had that whole breakfast scene and none of that was set up like him being sad or something he walked out for school and then comes in sad like it's been bothering him the whole yep, time i agree and they use this as the whole explaining that why she went back to work and that things are different which is fine this scene works for me if they didn't do the intro but with the intro i feel like this is completely superfluous they should have at least showed him put the band-aid on him and like have him be like waiting for kiss and like, <laughs> Mike walks away. I like that you just did the grandmother from the clumps face. <laughs> <laughs> Come yeah, on, Cletus. <laughs> yeah. Let me know Cletus. Ben looks to his mother as like, you know, the caretaker, and to have dad do all this stuff, it doesn't feel quite the same. And he's asking why did she have to go back to work? And she's explaining that, like, she didn't have to go back to work, that she just wanted to go back to work. And I feel like this time in the 80s, too, was, like, when there's that big resurgence in, like, going, like, not just the woman was the house, you know, like, stay-at-home mom at all time. And, like, that that was really kicking back up around this time. I mean, think of the most amazing, one of the most amazing movies of all time, Mr. Mom, Michael Heaton, at this time, is pretty much that's the whole plot, right? That's the good old days where two incomes was a luxury, not a necessity to survive. <laughs> I also I called kind of bullshit when she was like, well, sometimes parents miss going to work and they'd like to go back to work. It's like horse shit. Anybody who was like, no. here's your choice. You can have as much money and stay home or you can go to work and have the same amount of money. You would choose home. Well, I think it depends on your house circumstance, right? So you figure this is a mother of three who's just spent like the last 15 years locked in the house with just her kids for the most part and wants to just be out in the world again and around other adults. Like I can understand that theory at this point. I had to get out. Your dad keeps humping my leg. Yeah. Your dad (laughs) is so fucking horny. I can't be here anymore. I need a breather. (laughs) But yeah, I mean the conversation just kind of, it's just her reassuring on that. Like, I understand that there's a lot of changes, but everything's going to be okay. You guys think Ben missed the bus because he was already on the cusp and they they had this the whole long conversation? Oh, yeah. She's certainly driving Ben to work now. She's like, fuck, it's like 745. You missed it. And then uh, the next scene, we see Jason and he's seeing a patient. And the patient's sitting there and he's going over a dream he had, which is basically like he said he was on a subway and a woman sits across from him. Beautiful woman. And then they're looking at one another. And it's getting like, they're like both sending each other kind of, you know, some vibes. And then she leans across and whispers to him, you have huge knees. <laughs> He's like, and what he does that the mean? the whole story like super breathy too. Like it's very like erotic. It was like a letters from penthouse scenario. Yeah. And um, the, the guy playing the patient is a actor named Alan Blumenfeld. And I looked him up and he's basically appeared on every TV show ever. He's one of those guys. He's got over 200 credits. He's in like everything where I'm like, what do I know this guy from? Did you see one episode though? Yeah. He's never like the main. He's in the Munsters today, which made me pop. Is he in Mantis? Joe, is he in Mantis? He is not. That's what I said. I was like, this guy's in 200 credits, including he has stuff on his IMDb that says upcoming to this day. Not on Mantis. Friday the 13th part six, but not Mantis. For Joe's sake, as I was looking this guy up, I I did the control F and started typing in Mantis to see if he <laughs> happened to be in it. Because now I'm curious at this point. Yeah, I was scrolling so, like, like when this started hitting the 90s, I was like, it could be here. It could be here. It's like 1993. You're like, we're getting close. Wait for we're it. Close. Here it comes. There's a ton. There's a, there's three, like, big character actory guys in this episode, and not a one of them in a Mantis. <laughs> And we see outside and we have Carol and Ben are both up against the door with like glasses to the door to listen inside. I don't think this works, by the way. I've tried this. I've never made it work. I don't know if it would work with like those with like a thick glass, like pint glass, the way they were kind of doing it. I'm not sure. I've never tried it to to say one way or another. 
but Mike walks in from outside and sees his, you know, two younger siblings doing it and says that that should be good for about five bucks a piece as far as um, being able to bribe them now because he caught them doing something they shouldn't. You guys think it's strange that he has his patience at the house, like with his kids, and he's like a psychiatrist. What's if he has like a dangerous one? No. I, I, I know it's I know it it's explained. It's just like you have all the kids there and this guy's like Oh yeah, that intrusion is not cool. I will say, Nick, you just mentioned it's still common to this day. I agree. Would never. Yeah. But you would I you would have to have a privacy exit is the only way like that works. I feel like you're gonna have like a what about Bob scenario where like your patient now knows where you live. He's gonna start showing up at your house and stuff. That's yeah, I guess could be a risk. Way to think about it, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I didn't really think about it, honestly. I have a. I forget. I forget which one is which. Because there's like, is he a therapist or a psychiatrist? Is he the one that can give you pills too, or not? I forget. They're two different. That's I don't the, remember. That's the yeah. Distinction. I'm crazy, so I've got one of each. And if either one of them was like, "Come talk to me at my house," I'd be like, "I would like another doctor." That's a crazy thing to do. When it starts every time, just like I can't remember. Are you the one that can give me pills? <laughs> it's like, uh, not anymore. <laughs> there's, a, and what? Was this room completely renovated for this, or is this like what a normal room in the house looked like? Because this is a hundred percent like a psychiatrist's office, like to a T, like ready to go. His room looks like the room Jeffrey Jones has in Beetlejuice, where he's like, "Don't touch this room. Anything yeah. else, just leave this room alone." I assume it was his study before that, like where he had all his like books and shit to research new like psychiatry practices and stuff like that, and he just converted it. If it was Jeffrey Jones's room, it would have been filled with child porn, correct? If it was Jeffrey Jones's room, yes, it would be a much... Oddly, I don't think they invited him to be in Beetlejuice 2. I don't think yeah, he, I don't got, think the he got the call. Speaking of Beetlejuice 2, somebody stole the art from that. You know, the famous uh, crawling one that, like, grabs uh, the mom in it? Oh, yeah, that's, like, the yeah. piece that they smash into the house. Yeah, so someone stole that from the set, like, this past week. Oh. It was like the same one used from the original movie. And, and now they're going and now they're going to secure that place so much that like any joy anyone had driving by will now be gone because there's going to be a <laughs> fortress around it. Mm-hmm. Until the junkie from Providence tries to sell it on Craigslist. Like that's yeah. not going to take too long. That's how that works, right? Inevitably, that guy's going to like try to put it on eBay or something and just like. And, He's going to you know, walk into a pawn shop with it on his <laughs> shoulders. like <laughs> Breaking through the glass. <laughs> Traps the pawn guy up against the wall like in the movie. Jason and his patient head outside into that main area where the kids are. And while they're talking, Carol and Ben are both like completely bent over, just staring at his knees now because they heard the story that he told. I thought that was a funny little gag. And his reaction too. this is like a great little tiny bit of uh, physical comedy. I really enjoyed the knee scene here. And now once he leaves, Mike asks his dad, like if he could talk to him for a minute. And very serious tone, too. And then he asks, like, specifically, can we head into your office to separate himself from his siblings? And it's like, you know, Dad, we've been friends now for a long time. I was like, "Eh, off and on. Yeah. (laughs) This basically is all about how he wants to be able to go to the house of sweat. And he's he had already made plans with his buddy, Jerry, Jerry Delish, who is an older friend of his. He says he's an excellent driver. He's had two years of driver's ed. He's like two years. Like, yeah, he's like he ran over a dog, but. Uh, he drove beautifully after that. They're going over it, and he's like, well, what would your mother have said to this? Like, she would have said no, so he's assuming that, you know, this isn't going to happen. But Jason does kind of have this point where he's like, well, listen, he's like, you know, I make my own decisions. I don't just do things the way mom would have. And not in, like, a defiant way. I think that the dad is usually portrayed in shows. He's just kind of, you know, being his own person here. And does tell him that he can go. You know, there's this whole line about, like, Mike says he's ready for total responsibility. And he's like, Mike, I'm not even ready for total responsibility. As somebody who was the same age as him, I thought we all, or all the same age as him, I thought we all would have enjoyed that line where it's like, yeah, that's, that's accurate. None of us are ready for total responsibility. Yeah. And he's worried. He's like, is mom going to be mad? And Jason's like, Mike, your mom's not an ogre. I'll talk to her. She'll understand. And then it cuts right over to her, you know, later in the day when she finds out when the two of them are talking this is good cutting, too. This is good sitcom editing. Yeah, it was a, the nice quick cut to get you forward. So the two are having that argument, right? And, and mom's just kind of that idea, like, he's only 15 years old. And, you know, he's like, well, you know, he's going, you know, with his friend, Jerry. Jerry Dillish, Dillish. He goes, 
Jerry Dog Killer Delish. <laughs> the way the way she overreacts to that, and like I love you it. see legit sadness yeah. come over her. And it's, he was like, Maggie, he hit one dog. <laughs> she goes, Yeah, but he hit it four <laughs> times. I was trying to figure out the logistics of how this can happen. He's just running over a dog just back and forth. Up and yeah, going it's brutal. Over it's over. absolutely brutal. Like, speaking of Jeffrey Jones, not that I hate that sentence, but his scene in Stay Tuned where he's driving over Miss Daisy, where he runs over her <laughs> and puts the car in reverse and drives over her again. <laughs> also, Jerry the Dog Killer Delish is the best, like, 1985 indie wrestler name of all time. That guy was probably, like, just a big fat jobber who would have been amazing. I also thought it was a little, I mean, it's extreme, right? Because now... She's so upset by this. She's now questioning whether or not she should have gone back to work. Like, just because he made one decision you don't agree with. At this point, nothing bad has happened. This is making you rethink all of your life decisions. You are going to quit your job because your husband let your 15-year-old son go to the house of sweat. Yeah. And again, I feel like this name is almost too extreme because it sounds worse than it is, right? When it's just an underage dance club, it's not. When you hear House of Sweat, you almost think it's like somewhere he shouldn't be allowed into. But this is like, it's not uncommon for 15-year-olds to be here. So it's not that crazy. It's very 80s, though. Yeah, and maybe that's part of it. Maybe the time being different makes it feel different to me when I see that name. Yeah, definitely looking back on it seems 80s because like, Clubs nowadays have like one or, you know, they're not named like that. That would just literally be called Sweat or House. Like, yeah, you, you don't exactly. have like well, a if, three if word. If Taffer took over, we changed the name. Now it's just called Sweat. It's called Sweat. I put on a butt funnel. <laughs> yeah. Like, right, you got Thanks a lot, buddy. Yeah. I will say, though, the favorite, my favorite thing ever, not to bring this up out of nowhere. I love but your that, John Taffer. <laughs> Thank you. I watched one recently where he, there was some shitty band playing. He's like, you call this a punk rock band? I saw Fear live once. And I was like, oh my God, Taffer's is losing his mind. I'm fucking losing it watching him. But just watching him rip open a band for shitty, being shitty is so funny. It's like, you're just a bar guy. Leave me alone. As if Fear would have been available to play. But yeah, they're just called Fear. If the, not if the club was called SNL. Would they play once? They did play once. <laughs> not allowed back again. <laughs> and yeah, and then they changed how they format their music from that point forward. So this is when Jason gets into super horny mode again. And this is when he's like, oh, it, you know, it's going to be fine. You know, he's gone. The kids are going to be asleep. He's like, I, I have some champagne ready. I bought some satin sheets. It's like satin sheets. And it's like, yeah, well, the guy showed <laughs> the guy in the store showed him some before and after pictures of a couple who tried them. And the they looked very satisfied. I'm like, what is a before and after photo of a couple who just bought satin sheets? <laughs> just porn just a picture of the two of them right after they fucked <laughs> like thumbs up like their hair is just messed up <laughs> like what what is the what is that photo what did you show them <laughs> penthouse like i i don't i actually don't know i was thinking that myself i think fig, i figure it's probably the wild hair i want to say too another like big difference between him and horny frank is he just has that seductive voice <laughs> too. so everything sounds a little dirtier maggie <laughs> because he knows he's gonna get it <laughs> he is, also he's like I w do you think the guy who sold him the satin sheets also was like also we're running a special right now here are some sleeping pills now put these in your kids gatorade make sure you drug them real good before you fuck your wife on these slippery sheets he did say that is a joke <laughs> that, he, that he gave them sleeping pills uh you assume it's a joke nobody can prove that he said he didn't really he could have just used cough medicine he said like but they are uh and then we can <laughs> you know the phone rings and Jason picks up and it's like, uh, yep, this is Jason Seaver. No, you must be looking for someone else. They said Jason Seaver. At this point, they know who they have. Could be a different Seaver. And then, but I love like the great way, um, the way he acted, it was great. While he's on the phone, he like looks over it real quick and just goes, take your clothes off. Like. <laughs> <laughs> That's where he's a little more hornier than horny. Yeah. Frank, he actually whispers, take your clothes off. And I, when, uh, when the, the phone call concludes, we find out that Mike's in jail, uh, got in trouble for driving a car. So, I mean, obviously there's going to be something was going to go wrong here. I don't know if that's what I thought was going to happen, but um, I was expecting he got drunk, but that wasn't what yeah, this happened. This seemed yeah. like a drunk scenario. Now, do you guys think that 
they banged before they went to the police station <laughs> to bail him out? And... Just to teach him a lesson? I do not think so, no. <laughs> I don't think there's much more of a boner killer than I have to go take my kid out of jail. I think that probably ended the scenario for a bit. That next scene... F- fun thing about that next scene, too, by the way, is... So, that whole jail scene is the only scene where Carol's not in it because originally the pilot was filmed with a different actress playing Carol. So in the original one, someone by the name of Elizabeth Ward played Carol Seaver, but she didn't test that well and was replaced by Tracy Gold, who we knew to become Carol for the duration of the show. How badly do you have to test How little is Carol in this episode? She makes like two lines. And for the audience to be like, this actress sucks. A 12 year old so badly that they changed the actor. That's wild. So what happened was they reshot much like how, when we covered full house and they replaced Danny, they reshot the episodes, uh, the scenes that they had to reshoot, but not the entire episode because she's not in it all that much. So a lot of the stuff was from the original pilot. Now, in the jail scene, I'm assuming because it's a whole set and so many extra actors and stuff, they just cut her scenes out of that part. So there, you don't, you'll notice there's no Carol in the scene, but the original actress, you can't see her in the background at times. You can track it, too, because when they come yeah. back, you can see Carol's with them, but you notice you don't see her at the jail. It's just Ben. I was, I was questioning, like, why did they bring Ben with them? <laughs> They woke up the littlest kid, and they were like, could I show you the big house, buddy? Because it makes sense. You think about it. Everything else is just in the house. It's the same set. This is the yeah. only time that they venture out they, to redo that whole thing when it cost them so much extra money. But to, to who said that, Joe or Ferg, about why would you bring the youngest? Because mm-hmm. the Carol can watch herself. She's kind of of that age where she can stay home alone. But then she should be watching Mike, too, then. Or Ben, too, then, rather, yeah. And obviously, you have to take the logic out, right? So when you think about it on a realistic standpoint, they're both in bed. They wouldn't be like, Ben, wake up. We're leaving. Carol, stay here. Like, it probably wouldn't happen that way. But for the sake of the situation that they were in on a production standpoint, you have to just... Honestly, if I didn't bring it up, like, did you all even notice she wasn't in it? I did because I know... Only because I was questioning why did they bring Ben. Right. When you deep dive, you catch the stuff. But yeah, most people watching probably wouldn't have even realized. But yeah, that next scene, we're in the police station. And you see Mike in the holding cell with a few other guys. And there's like that one biker looking guy that walks over to him. And he's like, oh, what are you in for, kid? He's like, I um, uh, I killed a man just to watch him die. <laughs> yeah, like he's has a southern accent for some reason. Yeah. Some reason. And then <laughs> and he asks the guy, you? And he's like, unpaid parking tickets. <laughs> and he's just like, <laughs> the biker backs away. That's such a a classic 80s trope character, too. Like, the biker, like, the prison biker. I love it. The tough biker, especially, but also in this way, too, where it's the tough biker who's not that tough. They do that a lot, too. That's a big one. And this guy is one of those guys, too, where I was like, how is this guy not in Mantis? This guy would have been a great Mantis villain. Reminds me of that episode of uh, Fresh Prince of L.A. when Carlton and... um... And Will get locked up with the biker, and he's like, oh, yeah. let my people go. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the family all shows up, and, you know, at first, I think Jason's trying to still justify and give his son the benefit of the doubt. And it's like, you know, you know how it is. These kids run in with, you know, have run-ins with these, the police officers, and some of these guys can be real macho headbangers. And you just see, like, the nicest cop in the world show up at the desk to greet them. He's like, oh, I just made some hot cocoa. Would you like some? I like how he said, I made a pot of hot cocoa. Would you like yeah. to? How do you make a pot of hot cocoa? That's how you made it in the 80s. You made it in a, a Yeah, pan. in a saucepan. I guess that's With the true, packets. actually, yeah. Well, if you're in a pan, I like the idea that he just went to the vending machine, got a bunch of, like, Hershey's bars, and just melted them down. This is pure hot chocolate. To me, like, the nostalgia is being in, like, a police station or anywhere like that, any waiting room back then was the old vending machines that you could get hot tea, coffee, hot cocoa, like those like don't exist anywhere anymore, but that's like such a nostalgic thing just to think about those from back in the day. Those are still on doctor's offices. Now it's all like K cups and stuff though. Like those big ass vending machines that did them. Also the fact that nobody, that not a hundred people were smoking in this scene is completely unbelievable to a 1985 police station. And this, um, this officer is explaining to them that, They found him in the parking lot. He had been driving around for like 12 minutes in the House of Sweat parking lot. And 
Jason's still like, oh, you know, a 15-year-old boy he drives his friend's car around the lot a few times. Like, that's normal. And then it's like, yeah, but he sideswiped a police car on the way out. <laughs> it's like, yeah. He tore that bumper off like he was peeling an orange. A $350 orange. Has anybody ever been in a situation where their car hit a cop car? No. 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 I know somebody no. who did. I wasn't driving, but I've been in a car when I was... The driver backed into a cop car. We got pulled over once. Just real quick. We got pulled over. Also, Providence. Pulled over. I couldn't believe the cops were letting us go. It was one of those scenarios. Really bad decisions. People were drinking way too much. Cops probably just didn't want to deal with it. They were like, just get the fuck out of here. And then the driver, not knowing what he was doing, put the car into reverse instead of drive. And just, like, slammed into the cop car that pulled us over. That immediately turned their lights back on. And we're like, you're pulled over again. I was just like, we're all going to jail tonight. Like, that's just what's <laughs> going to happen. It was like, you just, just resign yourself to it. Like, it's just going to happen. That's why you love sitcoms so much. You fucking live in one. Because that's right out of a sitcom. These cops must have gotten a call that exact minute that was like, the serial killer has like <laughs> just been spotted. And they were like, shit, we got to go. Because I have no idea how they let us go after that, too. But... It's a pretty terrifying moment. When they get to the cell, you see that Jerry kid is just on the ground, like face down because he's so drunk. And I think it was like they needed to explain how much Jerry was in jail also, but they didn't want to have to cast a whole different person or do anything with it. So they just like left him as like a nameless extra. They probably just told someone to get on the ground and not show their face. You don't even see the extra's name. It's just a, yeah, it's just a kid sleeping, making like a uh, drunk noises and. I want to go on the record and state that Mike did the right thing. All right. He didn't let yeah. his friend drive drunk. He tried to drive. That's true. There's other ways to handle it. Like and that gets addressed later when he's talking to his dad, like later in the episode. But yeah, it's like he could have just called them. But it was 15 year old logic. He did the right thing. Right. And he finds out that his punishment for all this is going to be two months uh, of being grounded. And he's like, oh, like way to go, dad. Like thinking like this is his mom's doing. And he's like, no, it was supposed to be one month. I'm the reason it's two months. And when he's trying to talk to him, they're going back and forth. And he's like, you know, dad, you said you'd talk to her, like thinking that like he should be fine. Like he was almost exempt from trouble. And that's when Jason just snaps like, damn it, Mike, you said you could act responsibly. And like, it was, I'm not, he snaps, like he's jarring away. It's fucking scary. He's, he's a scary, angry guy. No, see, I thought it was uncomfortable in the wrong way. I thought it was uncomfortably acted. It felt out of place. I get like what they were trying to convey. I don't, I, I don't know. I didn't like it. I thought it was weird. I think on an acting standpoint, it was fine. It was very believable, but it was, like, too real for a sitcom. That was the thing. He got so aggressively angry so quick and, like, legit snapped at him. And I'm like, this isn't fun. And I know, like, I talk about this in other episodes all the time. I feel like there's always a time and a place for serious in sitcoms. But with pilots, like, I really like the pilot to stay fun. You know, you, you don't want to get too serious. And this got real serious because this was like a real yelling at. This is a, you, you're getting PTSD. Like, you're getting flashbacks of being yelled at by your parents now. Yeah. It's like, and it's like, this isn't fun. <laughs> this is making me think of bad things. And he's a guy with a really serious job. And there's, like, serious consequences to being sent to prison or going to jail for the night. Like, there's a lot of seriousness around the plot of this episode. He just he basically snaps because Mike made him look like an asshole. He went against his wife's wishes, said, have benefit. I know more than you, even though I've only been the stay at home dad for a couple of days. You've done yeah. it your whole life. Let's do it my way, baby. And he made it's, him he's look mad bad. at his son, but he's mad at himself. Yeah. yeah. But that I feel like it's it's warranted and I didn't find it out of place. I was fine with this. It was totally warranted. It was just that level of aggression and the way it, the tone yeah. shift was just like a little like, ooh. Because usually in a lot of other shows, there would be some sort of a little like, and then Ben would go like, Jeepers, Dad. <laughs> you know, like say something, you know, just to lighten it up. And yeah, there but it was, was no. M Mike wasn't understanding the situation. He was still going on like he didn't do anything wrong. And wow, mom's a bitch and like all that shit. And he finally just snapped. You, you, you got to get through to these kids or they're going to end up in there again. Also, for the horniness, too, I feel like he gets that call and he's like, I'm prolonging getting laid right now. And he's he gets so to the prison and he knows he's right not now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Another thing, too, where Mike is arguing with, with Jason about the grounding, you are literally in jail. <laughs> You're like, in jail. <laughs> like, what do you think? Like, he's going to have to go to court 
and potentially get put on probation. Yeah, if you're going to try to, like, lessen your grounding, like, you got to deal with that not in this moment. You have to, like, pick Maybe your wait moment. Maybe we're home, yeah. yeah. Wait a I'm couple sure. days. Dad's in a good mood, you know, like, try to try to get that back down to a month. I do think the dialogue's a little off, too, because he literally just came off telling him, it was going to be one month if it was your mom. I made it two. And he's like, I thought you were going to talk to her. He just told him that this is coming from him. He did, yeah. What's he going to talk to her about? And yeah. maybe that's it. Maybe it's the frustration that like Mike doesn't understand that his father is like also there to be his parent. And that would make it make a little more sense to yeah. me, actually. Yeah, because that scene rolls right into when they get back home, and it's like that quiet at first. They all walk into the house through their gigantic fucking kitchen, and they're and they're going in, and it's uh, there's no dialogue. You just you know it's just the sound of like the keys, the light switch on, and he storms right through that door, and you it's slamming every door behind him in dead silence. And walk straight up to his room. And then this is when they finally inject a little bit of that comedy in there. Because, you know, Maggie follows him into the room. And he trips over the champagne setup that he had. And then he goes to sit on the bed. And he falls off the satin sheets. He slips on the satin sheets. I genuinely lolled so hard at So, this like, scene. all the stuff he set up. Yeah, everything that he set up for himself to get laid turned into, like, a fucking home alone situation. And they're all booby traps by the time he got home later on. Oh, wait, this is what I was alluding to when i said i think he hit his wife because when they're in the kitchen and he walks out the thing she follows him through the door and you just hear and it's the door slamming but it sounded like he just bite, he punched her <laughs> it's bad editing where it's, she's too close even the yeah. kids are like <gasps> let me ask you guys this if you were in you and your significant other's bedroom just trashing it regardless of for what reason would she just sit there and be like oh you're crazy you're just mad no you'd get beat up <laughs> for just trashing the room like that i think he was at such an unprecedented level of anger for himself that it was almost like she knows her husband will have to be like i need to just let him get this out of his system and take a breath i guess yeah but no, I've never had a pajama meltdown to my <laughs> wife before, but if I ever do, I will let you know how it goes. Because that's what this whole scene is. It's just pajama meltdown. Should have been like, well, I guess I'll just have to sleep naked, huh? It's like, <laughs> it reverts right back to his horny self. <laughs> because she's trying to, like, talk him down, and she's, you know, she's trying to make light of the situation, and then she's like, don't patronize me, okay? And where the hell are my pajamas? I like I like when he's like, and they're big pajamas. <laughs> I want to see how big these pajamas are. Does he come right? out like a Talking Heads music video? <laughs> and I think every time he said it too, like I, I'm a someone who's I don't know if there's a tomato tomato, but I say pajamas. But he's he's very with the pajamas every time he says it. Yeah, a pajama as well. Pajama. I I don't wear pajamas, so I never say that. I don't either, but. I wear pajama pants in the winter because we live in New England and it gets really cold. If it gets real cold, I'll put yeah, some on a real on cold winter, winter night Yeah, but for I wear sure. sweats. They're sweatpants. That's what I call them, sweatpants. Yeah, I'm not wearing, like, my Ninja Turtle pajama pants anymore. I'm just in See, sweatpants, usually. I'm very specific. I need them to be cotton, though. I can't have, like, sweatpants material. I buy, like, the pajama pant material ones. Yeah, so I don't even own, I don't even own sweatpants, but I'll say... In a pajama situation, I mean, the interior material is more comfortable than a sweatpant. It's it's made to be more cozy for, like, lounging around. So that's why, you know, it exists. These are 80s sweatpants because this is 1985, so, you know, they get the tight ankles. Oh, those are real tight ankles going on, yeah. Those are short and Can't tight. Can't sleep in that. <laughs> and that's why he wants to use his pajamas. <laughs> now, do you guys own any pajamas? Yeah, I just told like, you. Yeah, I like, we just I have had like, a discussion about this. Yes. Yeah, we just, yeah. He was just so ready to ask the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I have like one or two pairs. I never wear them. But uh, if it's cold enough, I'll pop them on. Are they like sets? Like No, just the pants. I have sets, but I don't wear them, the tops. I never understood like the button up pajama yeah, shirt. No, like I don't want yeah. buttons in my sleeve. Yeah, that's uncomfortable. What about snaps? Snaps aren't bad. No, snaps are worse, I think. That's metal pressing up against you. Those are just like these days. Those still those just exist to take family pictures on holidays. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Touche. I've always wanted to wear the what are they called? Union suits with the butt flap. With the flap. You can get those. They sell those every year around Christmas time. So I thought this was interesting here. While he's tearing up the room looking for his pajamas, he's like, "There's a role reversal now." And then she's like, Jason, I don't understand why you're so upset. I mean, it's not like the first time he screwed up. And 
now she's like justifying it in that same way that he was earlier, where it's like, he's just a 15 year old boy. Like they make mistakes. And you know, now it's, it's a complete flip from all the conversations leading into the actual event. So it's almost like mom always knew this would happen, but she's somehow as mad as she was that he was going is more at peace with the negative situation that came of it, which is kind of interesting. She knows she, he's a fuck up. She's like, that's a good wife though. She passed right over her. I told you so moment. <laughs> Yeah. probably would have set him off i'll say how telling is that about ferg like ferg's like that's exactly how ferg would respond and you could tell by his <laughs> lack of satisfaction that she got that yeah well she's horny as well she can't be patronizing him and then not get laid what does that have to do with this he just wants to keep saying horny i think at this point <laughs> so <laughs> he's just now, here's a question I had about this is a serious question about that, just to kind of piggyback on what Gordo is saying here. When he slips off the satin sheets, which is very funny, I've never slept on satin sheets before. No, is it the friction? I have, and that's legitimately happened to me. They're slippery, and the top comforter will not stay on the blank on the thing. So you'll wake up with no blanket on top of you because everything slides off them. Does it change when you're naked, though? Is it less slippery as a naked when you're naked versus I gotta when you know have for, on? Why did you have satin sheets? Because they're super comfortable. They don't yeah, look what, comfortable. What hotel were you at with <laughs> the roadside listen, that had um, side sheets? I was going to say, listen, not to be too telling, but we tell a lot about our lives. And it's not even about me. I'm just telling you a lot about Ferg. If you remember, at a point in time where Ferg still did wear undergarments, he was a big fan of silk boxer shorts. So he, that's so that's a, weird. That is a sensation that he's very much a fan of. The great sensation on your skin. <laughs> <laughs> So I feel like this is very similar too. To use satin sheets is um, not a stretch from the silk boxer shorts. They they are comfortable, but very inconvenient. Both the uh, boxer shorts and both? The sheets. Yeah. yeah. If if I had worn both, I probably would have went out the window. <laughs> I'd have Ferg die. Imagine the CSI <laughs> detectives there with the little like lights and the things trying to figure out how the trajectory of this all went down. <laughs> uh, so now we cut back to the kids in the kitchen. And they're kind of talking about how they've never seen dad look that mad before. And Carol's kind of saying, like, you know, it's not so bad. Like, I bet in a year he'll look back on this whole thing and laugh, maybe chuckle. We cut back to the bedroom again, and now, like, the mess is ungodly. Like, there are clothes everywhere. It's a great visual. He's, he's finally, like, out of his rage a little bit, and he goes, okay, I admit it. I'm upset with Mike. <laughs> there was like, like when you go to those thrift stores that have, like, the dollar a pound section where there's just, like... 10,000 pounds of clothes poured onto a floor. That's what they, like, set this bedroom up as. But that was all just the equivalent of him getting his rage. It was like punching a punching bag, hitting the yeah, pillow. He needed like it. That. And that's he the thing. And that's why I think, the room, like. I think Maggie acknowledged that he needed to get that out of his system. And then when he's talking later, he's saying how, you know, he was not even but three feet away from me and said, Dad, I swear I'm ready for total responsibility. And you get that nice callback now where Maggie's going, Jason, you're not ready for total responsibility. So it's like that whole full circle from the conversation he had with his son earlier. They do a great job of the callbacks in this episode. I will say the writing is pretty strong. And it's just more like parent talk where it's, you know, he's concerned about him being, you know, he's growing up and he wants him to be a man and be ready for it. And nothing crazy at that point. Like he's, he's coming off that, that rage. So they're just kind of having that normal par parental conversation here. And we get back to the kitchen and Mike's asleep, like falling over, like the they have like an island, like in the middle of the kitchen, and he's just sitting on like a bar stool, like completely like over the island now, asleep with Why? his glass of milk. Yeah, draped over the island with a glass of milk. It's a weird spot. Move I, to the couch, I don't man. understand it. Yeah, see, my, Mike's love milk. That's what we do. And it's like he's just a kid, so he's just you know, it's reminding you he's he's growing up, but he's not there yet. And that's when Jason walks in, and he wakes him up. He's like wait, what's going on? He's like, you were asleep. He's like, I was, I was, and it was a dream. Like, so he's like hoping that all this shit didn't actually happen. I, I actually thought his acting was, I would say actually in, in this case, in general, uh, Kirk Cameron's like acting and portrayal of Mike, I thought he was a pretty good actor for a child actor. Yeah, he's not in a lot of stuff that we would probably see nowadays because he makes very specific kinds of things. He doesn't do a lot of like sitcom appearances or anything anymore, but he's so good in this. And at the time too, when he plays like the cousin on full house, like he's just, like a very charismatic yeah. and good actor as a teen on full house with his sister, Candace, with Cameron? his sister. Yeah. And he's explaining to his dad in this moment, like, everything we, we had mentioned before, 
you know, his friend was way too drunk and he didn't want him to drive. So, you know, and he was the one who made that call. So he was being responsible to a degree, but then his way of handling it at the end of the day was not, you know, the best. And his dad's like, well, you know, you could have called. And he's like, well, dad, there were girls there. He's like, oh yeah, of course. Like you wouldn't want them to think you had parents. <laughs> like, you know, it's just kind of that typical conversation that that father son like come down. And I like when he's talking about like, you know, himself, he's like, Mike, you probably don't remember this, but when you were three weeks old, yeah, obviously you wouldn't fucking remember this. He was three weeks old. Like I thought he was going to say like three years old. That's the takes joke. A three-year-old to a 1970s baseball game. Three weeks were old. A quarter, and you know, it's just a bad idea. Yeah. Not a three-year-old. <laughs> Three weeks old. Three weeks. <laughs> 21 days. Yeah, a baby, a tiny baby, soft spot, still very soft. So I just love the idea that, like, in that presentation, like, Mike, you probably don't remember this. Like, obviously <laughs> he doesn't remember this. There's no fucking chance he remembers this. This is a 1970 Mets game, then, we're led to believe, right? Because he's 15? Uh, Yeah, so 1985 minus 15 or so. Yeah, 1970, 1971. He gives a player. I didn't look up the player himself. Um, yeah, they were basically like someone hit like a big shot to the left field and like he hugged him really tight and he was jumping up and down and it made him throw up. <laughs> and it was like. He also says he let him suck the bear off of his finger. And I don't know if that was him joking. I think it was, that was like. <laughs> I think it was funny that Mike's initial response was to say, I'm sorry. When he told him that he threw up all over yeah. him. He's like, no, he's like, that was my fault. Like, in the. It was kind of a weird way to like set the example of like you messed up, but it was my fault. Like, and he's trying to kind of convey that message, but the story he's telling him doesn't really make much sense. Like I jumped up and down when you were a baby and you threw up like, okay. Why did Maggie let him take the three week old to a baseball game? That's the point. That's the point of the story is even him as an adult made stupid decisions when he was younger. Sure. Here's a question. Genuinely though. Do you have to pay for the kid's ticket? Not at three weeks. No, no. Do you think the guy at the ticket place was like, wait, you're bringing in a three-week-old? No, you're a fucking idiot. You don't have to pay. You don't have to keep your dollar, buddy. I don't care. And then Mike's like, like, I try to do the right thing, but, like, every now and again, I just end up doing something really stupid. Like, it's an uncontrollable impulse. Like, I don't understand. And that's when his dad's, like, trying to explain to him, like, I've done some pretty stupid things in my day as well. Well, he says, I did some pretty lame-o things lame-o in my day. Lame-o. lame And um, he's telling him when he was 16, him and his buddies drove around all night mooning everybody. And they accidentally um, mooned the mayor's wife. I don't know why this made me laugh way harder than it should have. <laughs> like, it wasn't even that good of a joke. And I just, <laughs> the thought of Alan Thicke driving around mooning people, I was dying. Hey, look at this. <laughs> you like this mayor's wife? People don't moon anymore. Mooning, mooning went away because it's now it's like that's an offense now. Now you're a sex offender. Yeah, yeah that's it's <laughs> it's yeah it's turned into not that it not that it's a different thing than it was then, but the way it's handled and treated like and perceived, it's a, yeah, more severe repercussions these days. So that's why you don't see streakers or anything anymore. Like in the seventies and eighties, you'd see streakers at like baseball games and stuff all the time because it wasn't yeah. really a big charge. Yeah. Now it's also why like, you don't oh. pull your uh, pants all the way down at a urinal. <laughs> 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 if only there was an arrestable charge for that. Now this has come up before. And I just want to remind those of you listening, I don't do that anymore. And it was, <laughs> it was something I did when I was in my young twenties, like late teens, early twenties. I love what you say. Something I did in my young, everybody's expecting you to be like when I was like six years old and I didn't know any better. I, yes, but I'm just saying. I was young. I was 24. <laughs> just a thing I did. You know, as we're, as we're like getting closer to 40, it's just, it didn't happen a month ago. It was just reiterating. It was a bit, it was a while ago, but he tells them like, because they were mooning everyone, they ended up getting arrested for indecent exposure. And <laughs> he said the mayor's wife refused to make an identification i didn't quite understand because she didn't want to look at a she bunch of look butts. At the butts is that what it was like she was yeah. gonna have to like go to the police station and all of them have to stand there with their butts out <laughs> all right <laughs> boys drop your trousers yeah. <laughs> all right the mayor's wife is here show everyone your butts <laughs> it was that one the one with the mole <laughs> i would know that derriere anywhere <laughs> 
And he, Mike goes, does mom know about this? It's like, are you kidding? How do you think we met? <laughs> How do you think we met? She was the mayor's wife at the time. It was a really weird story. <laughs> she was she was just out with her friends and she just saw a butt drive by. She's like, I need to find that butt. It's like, I'm gonna marry that butt. I'm gonna put a ring on that butt. <laughs> he asks his dad, like, do you still have like the urge to do dumb stuff now? And he tells him, like, not really. He's like, I think that's what being an adult is about. Like those like urges kind of subside a bit. I call huge BS on this. This is when I looked up how old he was, and I was like, we are all the same age, and I have the urge to do the stupidest shit all the time still. I imagine you guys all do as well. The correct, yeah, the correct answer would have been... The level is different. Yeah, the correct answer would have been, yes, those urges are still there, but being an adult is knowing how to fight those urges. Right, now stop them. Yeah, not that they don't exist. And then Mike leaves the kitchen, leaving Jason in there by himself, and he just goes, hey, come back in here for a sec and then you see jason like you see the front end go see his face and you see him like drop his pants <laughs> to moon his son but then instead of mike walking in maggie walks in instead and just walks into a room and sees her husband's asshole and, then and she gets horny all over she gets, like, again. excited yeah she it's like, like <laughs> she like runs to it yeah. she, it's like a freeze frame <laughs> we like <Yeah>. this <laughs> She's so that's when she tells him that a uh, you know a shorthand name for Margaret is Peggy, and that's where their <laughs> night is going from there on out. Ooh, I, I love <laughs> hairy butthole in the kitchen. <laughs> as long as we got it. Listen, they they were trying to they were trying to make it work, you know, that whole day, and I think it finally happened after she walked into that because the next scene over is like. It's the morning again, and she's back to, you know, cooking breakfast in the kitchen and singing. And she's definitely having that I just got laid type of sing. She's singing. Um, well, she's singing I Feel the Earth Moving on My Feet by Carol King. That is an I Got Laid Last Night song. Yeah, that. Yeah, she absolutely. She was. Well, she got mooned and it brought her back to her first date. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There's nostalgia in seeing that. But <laughs> the two start kissing. Uh, Jason walks in while she's singing. And then eventually all the kids walk in and they start singing Moon River. You know, because of butts. Also, why does one of them just have a pitch pipe? I didn't catch that. <laughs> was it a pitch pipe or was it just a harmonica? It was a pitch pipe. So, like, so they could all be in key. Like, they had a, like, they, that this happens enough that they have to be harmonized with each other. Yeah. That they have to pull a key out every time. We can't mess this joke up. <laughs> I thought it was, uh, the Moon River thing was, like, it was corny because the song. I don't know. Something about it. It felt too old to me to use that song, but... Well, I will say they used the same joke in Fletch, like, two years later. I was gonna say, Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase, when he's getting the anal um, probing from the doctor, sings Moon River as, like, the butt joke, too. I think about um, Grease 1, the better Grease, when there's the blue moon scene when they're all on television and, like, all the kids, like, moon the TV, like, because they're all being, like, recorded for, like, an American Bandstand type show. During, so, like, during Blue Moon, they decide is obviously the time to do it. I also thought of the episode of The Simpsons where they go to Branson and they go to see Andy Williams because uh, Nelson makes them go see him. He's like, boom, second encore, he did Moon River. That's right after, that's right after they go to Bronson. <laughs> Bronson, Missouri, where I would move in a heartbeat. Hey, Ma, can I get some cookies? <laughs> no dice. <laughs> this ain't over. And it just closes out uh, after that, after getting a few bars of moon river out it's just the parents shooing them out of the kitchen and then you know we get the freeze frame and end of episode fun note i guess to like you know nothing crazy but it's a sitcom i would have ended it at the moon just saying the moon is the logical end oh no oh, no that. when he moons and she walks in i would have ended you know, it at that I, that probably would have been a fun way to end it yeah you're right maybe that extra scene wasn't really needed but uh and then yeah just for the credits we get like that instrumental version of the theme song and it just kind of plays over some still episodes uh still shots throughout the episode. And yeah that was like that was the conclusion of the show. As far as Growing Pains goes again it's one of those shows I watch so much of it and remember so little about it. So it's like tough. I don't have a lot of other notes about the show like nothing specific I wanted to bring up. I don't know if any of you guys wanted to tail in with anything. The one thing I wanted to bring up is we kind of mentioned a bit at the beginning, but the last season, it might be the last two seasons, is like the breakout role for Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh, yeah, Leo, yeah. And I always find it strange that this show is... Not Critters 3, Joe? Yes, for Critters 3. <laughs> From This Boy's Life and Critters 3. <laughs> um, but I thought this, I think it's weird this movie's, uh, show's not as remembered for how revered he is now as being such a big thing. 
No, when he when he first got famous, they kept. I remember that getting brought up a lot. Like Leo got a start on Growing Pains and stuff. Who was he on Growing Pains? He, he was, was like, like an adopted the friend that they like adopted. Yeah, yeah, they like brought him in. Oh, okay. Late season. This show also did the fun thing too that a lot of shows do that I love, where like they had a baby in like season four at like they the had last a baby. Episode. It's a boy. <laughs> but Bob, it's a boy. Uh, but then like <laughs> episode one of season five, the baby's like seven. Like I love when shows do that where they're like babies are hard to work around, so we're just gonna age the kid a bunch of years while the Fresh show's Prince on. was famous for that. Fresh Prince did it, yeah. So I don't know if you had caught this. I guess early in the run at some point. Rival network NBC poke fun at growing pains on their show Golden Girls in the episode Family Affair with Dorothy claiming, I can't believe Alan Thicke has a hit series. I do remember that episode, yeah. Shots fired. That's like a legit, like, they're rival networks. It's like a legit shot. Love it. I feel like I wouldn't want to do that as an actor, though, because you're like, that's some, like that's a writer's agenda. You know what I mean? Like, some yeah. writer wants to make that joke, and you're like, I'm going to fucking see this guy at a restaurant. Like, we're all like in the same circles. I mean, like, I don't want to be like, I, I, don't, I didn't really mean it, man. Shouldn't they know that? Because they're actors? I guess, but it's like the butts and seats thing. It's like, even though he didn't write it, it still kind of stings to hear it from somebody in your own profession, you know? I also thought it was kind of interesting that River Phoenix actually auditioned to play Ben Seaver. Maybe he'd still be alive if they cast him. I was just going to say, like, imagine if we still got River Phoenix. You may have, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, the, the whole world changes. But also imagine the weird world where Stand By Me stars Kirk Cameron. I mean, it's a whole different thing. And actually, uh, Jason Seaver, one of the people considered for the role of that was Bruce Willis. What a totally different type of actor. Yeah, I, it wouldn't feel the same at all. Wasn't he, wasn't Moonlighting happening at this point? I don't remember the specific years. He might have been fresh off of... Um, Moonlighting may have just ended. Moonlighting ran, uh, you know, 1985. So it's probably, he got that over it. Uh, over it, yeah, interesting. You guys remember that 90s Disney movie, Not Quite Human? Name sounds familiar, but not ringing the name. It starred Alan Thicke. He was like a, a, he was like an inventor, and he invents a son named Chip Carson, and he's huh. like a robot going to school. It was just that was the only other time, like back then, that I knew of Alan Thicke. I didn't know about his past or other stuff like I do now, but like, and you might know his son now as one of the hosts of The Mass Singer, Robin Robin Thicke. Thicke. And also, we didn't say to Alan Thicke, R.I.P. Dead a few years ago. Yeah, R.I.P. But I will say the one thing that I will bring up of Alan Thicke. Wait, the last Alan Thicke time. died. Yeah, yeah, he was like ago, playing. Yeah. He had like a heart attack. He was like playing hockey, playing hockey, like in his like outside with like one of his sons. No shit. Did he die before or after his episode of Fuller House aired? Ooh, I think it was a tight timeline. It might have been after. He might have died before it aired. I don't remember specifically, but it was it was right around that same time. But one last final great Alan Thicke performance is him as the rival dad car ownership dealer in The Goods. Which is one of those movies that is like Grandma's Boy, Such where a like, good movie. people dismiss it, but it is so fucking funny. It is way better than it has to. It's way better than it deserves to be. It's when so I good. saw it, I remember seeing it in theaters, and I wanted to love it because I was so obsessed with like Jeremy Piven at the time. I was watching Entourage like religiously, and I just wanted to love that movie, and I just didn't. Watch it again because it really holds up. If nothing else, just watch the scene where Will Ferrell the goes dildos? plummeting to the earth surrounded by dildos. <laughs> it goes, oh no, the dildo's back. Fucking <laughs> <laughs> funny scene in a movie in so long. We did a pretty deep dive in this episode and we've talked a good amount. So to not keep you guys yeah, too much longer, might as well get into the Green Lantern cancel. Gordo, we're going to start with you. I'm actually kind of torn. What's strange is that I didn't hear any of you guys say this scene cracked me up until the end. This was not a funny sitcom. I can take or leave this episode. Like, I, I really just kind of... It was fine for what it is, but I kind of don't want to see a second episode. And it's no fault of any actor. It's just... It's a bland, okay show. So, with, with that in mind, like, I, I think I'm going to lean towards cancel. Joe. Yeah, I mean, to me, this is, I understand what you're saying, Gordo, and I, I totally get that. But I will say for me, this is one of those just capital S sitcoms. Like, it just works so well, and it's such a comfortable spot to be in. I really did like it as a kid. I really did enjoy it, uh, watching it now. When you mentioned you don't see yourself buying or seeing another episode, like an hour ago, I was like, if I see the full season at Walmart or series over, I'm gonna buy it. I feel like on that alone, that has to be a green light. Like, if I'm willing to go out and spend money to keep watching it, Maybe a lot of it's nostalgia. I'd like to see how less horny and how 
like when it all sort of evens itself out because the first episode as we know it's what we do it's always going to be a little wild to everything but i just love this era of sitcoms i love the spinoffs it created i love all these characters it's kind of crazy to think this show is as old as we are uh, it's a green light for me Berg, you think i'm gonna cancel something with that sitcom i mean with that uh theme song so good but no besides that i enjoyed it i have extreme nostalgia for this show i it's one of the first sitcoms I remember watching and remember stuff about. I don't know if that's influencing me, but I enjoyed this episode a lot. Like, the whole thing. Gordo's right, it's not, like, side-splitting funny, but it, it is funny. Like, <laughs> just breaking down, like, that family dynamic and the role reversal of, like, the dad and mom. At, like, throughout the show, like, they swap, like Jay brought up. It's all, like, that's all good writing, and I just enjoyed it. I don't have, like, a clear-cut reason <laughs> Other than that, but so green light. Nick. This episode was potato salad. Uh, Gordo stole one of my words that I was going to use. It's so bland. It's uninteresting. I did not enjoy this episode, like, at all. I, there was maybe two laughs I got out of it. It's just, I, like Ferg said, with the nostalgia influencing him, I wonder if me not ever watching this show, well, not ever, not not ever watching it. I just didn't really remember it. So I don't, I don't have any of the nostalgic, you know, rush to go along with seeing this again. And I maybe was expecting more because of, you know, how popular this show is. Um, it was a huge hit. And maybe I built that up uh, a little too much. But I was overall just truly unimpressed with this show. I didn't think it was very original or... I mean, the acting was good. I'll, I'll give it that, too. The act, I don't think the acting contributed to how I felt about it. I think it was acted well. I just think just overall it was there was nothing here that really made me want to come back for more. It was just really unoriginal and kind of just too boring for me. So, yeah, it's a pretty easy cancel, surprisingly. So, yeah, so I find myself in a tiebreaker situation. To be honest with you guys, I'm I'm think I'm going to cancel this one. Now, I'm in I'm in a situation where I I think and even Joe when you talk about it, it's a lo- you're talking a lot of I loved where the show was. I loved the spinoff, but like to look at just this episode and try to take all that nostalgia out. And I know it's tough because we always, you know, have this kind of issue. If I'm watching this for the first time and I take all my nostalgia away from it, it was fine. I liked the characters enough. I think there was some good chemistry there, but I keep saying like, when you get that, that dark tone, when Jason like really freaked out and this is my first impression of the characters, I don't, I'm not having fun now, and I don't know if that leaves, like, the right taste in my mouth. So, with all that in mind, it's just, it. I don't know, it just, I know I like the show, I, I've i watched plenty of it, it I kind of do want to go back and watch it again, having seen this, but not on the merits of the pilot episode. So, I'm going to have to go to cancel. So, with that being said, unfortunately for Growing Pains, that's only two out of five, so you're being canceled by us, believe it or not. So, sorry, best of luck to all to everyone involved in your future endeavors. With all that being said, that's all we have for this week. So, thank you to everybody who listens. Again, I want to remind you to go to s1e1pod.com. That's where you can find all the links to our social medias, where to listen to us, rate, review, subscribe, do all of those things. Those help us out big time, so we really appreciate when you do. And then again, go to s1e1pod on Twitter and Instagram. Hit us up. We like talking to you guys. Tell us the shows you want us to cover. Maybe we'll get to them in the near future. That's all the time we have for this week. So until next time, thank you. Goodbye. I think we got the best House of Sweat shirts. There's something we'll be saying shortly. Because I'm going to get them made. 